welcome to episode 294 of the At Percussion Podcast. Uh, this is Ben Charles, and with me, as always, are Casey Cangelosi. Hey, what's up, Ben? Hey, Casey. How's your uh, How's your semester getting off to a start here? It hasn't started. There's still like a whole There's still like a whole week away, which is like months away. Do you have like meetings? Uh, meetings pretty soon. Yeah, we're doing the Stanton Music Festival soon. We've got a nice dedicated like percussion concert, peace of mind, peace of Eric Genevin, some crumb. And uh, yep, once we get through that, we'll do a big opening faculty meeting. The percussion ensemble is going to play. Nice. And uh, yeah, then it'll feel like we start for real right after that. And Ksenia Komunovic, how are you doing? Hey, Ben, I'm, I'm doing well. It's almost midnight here in Europe, so it's a fun little party with you all. <laughs> when, do you, uh, when do you come back to Texas? Soon, soon, in just a few days, but not, nice. not quickly enough to get on the podcast properly. <laughs> <laughs> and and do, you have a, do you have a week of meetings also like Casey and I do? Yes, yes, all the fun, all the fun. Always fun. Well, we are recording this episode on August 14th, but it is releasing on August 26th. So if you're listening on release day, uh, we have a few uh, This Day in History items for you. In 1888, Tchaikovsky completes the score to his fifth symphony, uh, which has some lovely timpani parts in it. I actually got to perform that two summers ago, which was cool. In 1951, the film An American in uh, Paris premiered. That's the film that contains the music by Gershwin, which was composed a couple of decades earlier. In 1981, the composer Nico Muley was born. In 1983, the movie the Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence was released. It's a Japanese-British war film starring David Bowie, among others, and it has music by Ryuichi Sakamoto, which uh, Pius Cheng actually has a, a recording of. He's done a, a marimba version of it. And my big item for the day is that in 1967, Purple Haze entered the Billboard Hot 100 pop chart, where it spent eight weeks. And does anyone want to guess what number on the 100 chart it peaked at? Four. Ksenia? Well, I don't know. It should have been one. <laughs> 65. Unbelievable. Huh. <laughs> one what of the most iconic rock tunes of all time peaked at number 65 on the Pop 100 chart. Uh, the drummer on this tune was Jimi Hendrix's longtime drummer, Mitch Mitchell. Uh, and Mitch Mitchell described the recording as Jimi just sort of walked into the studio and sort of showed them how it went and they they went from there uh, it, it's widely accepted as the tune that launched the psychedelic era of music and at least it did uh rank on a couple of charts uh, or, uh, uh lists i should say on q magazine's 100 greatest guitar tracks ever it was number one and on rolling stone's 100 greatest guitar songs of all time it was number two and one of my favorite versions of the song is actually the chronos quartet has a version of it the, the very famous string nice. quartet has a version of it and it's it's super heavy it's like really slow and they really dig into all these glisses it's cool stuff so that is uh today in music history well let's get on to our guest today our guest today is nicholas sardello or nick sardello as we be calling him on this episode <laughs> He's a Texas-based music industry professional and creator. He's the manager of Immersio Entertainment, a fine arts group comprised of a music production and recording company, songwriting and music composition entity, and an ASCAP-affiliated music publishing company with plans to venture into artist management, music licensing, licensing, and other areas of entertainment. He graduated summa cum laude from Texas Christian University, and he served as a Grammy U apprentice for the Recording Academy. And I just wanted to mention that the way that I met Nick is he recorded me recently and he did a wonderful <laughs> job so welcome to the podcast nick thank you thank you it's great to be here i really appreciate you guys having me on and i'm looking forward to uh discussing some sweet topics with you guys yeah so i thought we would get started today uh since like we talked about you've done some recording work and you did my recording work uh <laughs> nick was actually the first person that i've ever actually hired and paid money to record me uh and I also like was like, why haven't I done this before? Because it was so it's such a great experience. So I thought we'd start out today uh, by asking Nick about why why do you think performers should actually look into hiring an actual recording engineer to produce their recordings? Right, right. And so this might have been the hardest question for me to answer, just because I really got to sell you know my business on this one. But <laughs> you know, probably the most important thing that I would consider if I were uh, you know trying to figure out if I wanted to hire an outside engineer, if I were the performer, would be 
you know, probably just the priorities that uh, are that I have at that moment for that event. You know, a lot of musicians really just want to focus on, you know, their playing and they want to be in that right mindset. You know, they don't often have the time to be worrying about the electronics and the logistics of the event. You know, each of those pieces all have their dedicated person. And so I think the engineer um, fits really well, nicely into that. Um, and so, you know, if I were going to perform a marimba solo that were going to be recorded, I would really want to stay, you know, keep like warming my hands up. You know, I would just want to stay in that mindset instead of trying to focus on, okay, are the mics placed in the right way? Are they, you know, how is the gain set on everything? You know, how does the room sound? You know, obviously as the performer, you probably are listening to the room, but you really just want to stay in that mindset. I, I would assume, and, and same with the conductor, you know, it could be whoever's uh, coordinating the recording. You know, if you're the conductor, you're focused on the other logistics of the event. You're really just trying to make everything go as smoothly as possible. And so I think an engineer fits uh, really nicely into that. And so the second point that I have, uh, if I were going to consider hiring someone would probably just be the knowledge and perspective that they bring to the table, you know, so an engineer is going to have a little bit different viewpoint of the acoustics of the room, you know, their knowledge and prior experience with acoustics might be different than that of the performer. And so they really can sometimes bring a vastly different perspective uh, than the, than the conductor, the performer. And so the moment the engineer arrives on site, they're thinking about all those things, you know, where am I going to place the mics? How does the room sound? Uh, what types of microphones, how many are there going to be, you know, what is the, the spacing of the ensemble. And so all of those little details that are going to affect the recording might be overlooked by if you were just the performer trying to make all of that happen yourself. And so that also goes along with, you know, the efficiency, the timeline of the recording, whether it's a, a live performance or, or a recording session. And so, you know, adjusting microphones, swapping things out, any changes that need to be made, you know, someone who's the performer is not going to be able to A, B those changes and, and hear the difference um, in a timely fashion um, as to be able to make adjustments um, for that performance. And so it's really important for the engineer to always be listening uh, to make those adjustments and to make it go as smoothly as possible. Uh, like I said, whether it's a live event or a recording session. And so I think it's really just about having the, the right person for the job um, for each aspect of the event. I think it also probably goes a little bit along with um, the budget, obviously, of the event. Trying to figure out a budget for an event can be pretty complicated sometimes. And so it's going to depend on your goals for the recording. But in order to capture the acoustic nuances fully of the ensemble at the, at the highest level possible, you know, sometimes the budget for that can be $10,000, $30,000 worth of gear. And so that can be pretty substantial to if you're just the performer trying to do it yourself. And so I'll get into in a little bit a different lens to sort of look through recording of, and that is just, you know, personal recording for analyzation, like maybe you're preparing for an audition um, and that sort of thing. But if you're trying to really capture the audio in the most true way possible and even make a CD or, or, or publish that recording, you know, sometimes that budget can get pretty high. And so there's a lot of different aspects that go into, um, you know, whether it makes sense to hire an engineer, an engineer or not. And so sometimes it does actually make sense for the performer to do it themselves. And like I said, if you're just recording yourself for, uh, for analyzation purposes, trying to better your playing, or maybe it is for an audition, that can sometimes differ. And maybe it actually does make sense for you to record yourself. And so I think we're going to talk about that in a little bit as well on how to make that happen versus if you're actually trying to, to make a recording that is going to be produced afterwards. You know, Nick, like yourself versus professional, like yourself, sorry, that was silly, but uh, <laughs> what, what is the, uh, like, like, what's a common thing you see most, let's say, like, you know, percussionists in a studio who they have a sound interface, they've purchased some mics, and they're recording themselves for YouTube. Uh, what, what, is, what is like the most common error you see, or a real common thing you think like, oh, yeah, you missed that, but a professional wouldn't have. Right, right. So the probably the most common error is definitely just having the right tools for the job. And some of that goes with types of microphones, microphone placement. Um, I see a lot of people like you, you gave the example of a YouTube channel, you know, sometimes, you know, placement, and, and I'm assuming also that that recording is probably happening maybe in their bedroom or, or in a similar sort of small space. You know, the types of mics and the mic placement in that sort of environment is vastly different than if you're on you know, a stage. And so 
definitely honing into the types of mics you're using, being able to have the listening skills to determine the differences between um, close miking something, or maybe you need more of that room sound to make um, that recording sort of fit in that environment. And so definitely just the types of gear, you know, maybe the, the microphone pickup pattern that you're using is not um, the most ideal for the room that you have. And so a, a YouTube channel that comes to mind, I think, uh, when I'm thinking about this sort of like at home recording is Adam Tan. And I know he's been on this podcast as well. So uh, the, he has tons of great resources on how to record marimba specifically um, if you're just doing it at home to practice and, and maybe make uh, small recordings or even songwriting. You know, how do you approach that type of recording versus, you know, maybe on site, on location, recording an ensemble? Gotcha. Nick, I think you hit on a, a lot of great points there with. Uh equipment and uh, the sort of like engineers understanding of sound. And I just wanted to mention that for the recording that I did, I recorded a, a movement of uh, Alejandro Vignao's Book of Grooves, which is a marimba duo. And the original plan was like, oh, we'll have like a stereo pair. That's it. That's good. <laughs> and then we got right, in touch right. with Nick and he was like, oh, I'm going to put a stereo pair on both marimbas. I'm going to have an additional mic on the base end of both marimbas uh, and two mics to pick up the, the resonance in the room. And it was at that point that my duo partner, Matt, and I looked at each other and we were like, okay, this, this guy knows what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> right. And right. Uh, beyond that, I mean, just like understanding, uh, there's a concept, if anyone's not familiar, of like the sound stage, which uh, when you listen to music, especially on headphones, it's like, is the sound coming from over there? Is it coming from over there? Is it a wide sound or is it a very focused sound? Uh, and that's something that even though I know what it is, I, I wouldn't have the first idea of how to make tweaks and adjustments to it. It's It's a very technical exercise that probably most performers aren't adept at doing. Um, and also one other thing that was great about Nick is that he said, you know, you don't want to be running the board and, and worrying about all this stuff. Uh, we kind of like, we're like, oh, we need to give Nick notes about use this take for this and use that take for that. And uh, we kind of maybe fumbled through that a little bit, but Nick just gave us a great recording without like any, any real notes on, on what to do. And it was kind of like, oh, can we have this one bar here and that one bar there? But Overall, his his first pass at it was pretty much like just about the final recording that you hear. I was I was amazed <laughs> by how great of a job he did. Um, but Nick, for the the uninitiated, I there's one terminology I wanted to cover because I don't think that I really fully understand the difference. Um, and it's probably something for bigger recording projects with a bigger budget. But there's a recording engineer, and then there's often also a producer. Can you explain the role of those two terms to us? Right, right. And so traditionally, the recording engineer in a studio would be the person uh, tracking, you know, placing mics, uh, making those adjustments, um, capturing the audio. And then most often, that audio that's captured after it's mixed would be sent to a producer or maybe a mix engineer, and then the producer. And so the producer is making sort of the final call on on different um, aspects of the music, you know, maybe they need to, to redo a take here or, or bigger picture sort of songwriting. Um, aspects and, and and analyzing what audio is given to him and how how do they make a final product out of that and then that would traditionally then go to the mastering engineer which is also sometimes the producer now All, a lot of the terminology uh, in the past like 10 or 15 years has really gotten sort of blurred because of the the boom of home recording and home you know music producing sometimes uh, the recording engineer can also be the mix engineer and the mastering engineer and the producer and the publisher, you know? And so traditionally those terms have sort of places in the, in the flow of how a product gets uh, put out. But most recently it's really blurred between, bet uh, between who's actually handling those, those pieces. So, especially in, in the music uh, that we record. So like you, Adam Tan, Evan Chapman, like do you guys get together at PASIC and just kind of laugh at the rest of us? <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we haven't done that. We might have to do that. I've actually never met Adam and I have met Evan Chapman once. He probably doesn't remember me, but I bought their uh, square peg round hole on vinyl once and had him sign it at uh, the oh, last Oh, that's so like, last that's so just like hipster percussionist. It's kind, it's kind it of, vinyl. <laughs> I, I'm sort of like an Evan Chapman fanboy. Uh, I would say, and I actually have some notes in here later on some of the stuff we're going to talk about, about Evan Chapman, but uh, yeah, that we might have to do that. We might need a recording engineer sort of booth at Pacey. You probably should. Like, you guys hear Casey's latest recording? It's so <laughs> Ksenia, I think you were next. Sorry. Uh, Nick, I wanted to know about your experience of these blurred lines. And when you get to take over the role of a producer, 
how do you handle that? The, does that happen spontaneously? Like you're at a session and you're expecting to only be handling the sound and then it turns out that the ensemble or the performer are expecting you to actually also produce things or do yes, you talk yes. to people in advance and how do you do that because we need very special vocabulary to communicate and we don't get to practice that a lot right right beforehand so and how do so you do that in my experience um i have had some of those uh things jump on me uh last minute and mostly it's it's actually not uh, a producing it's usually mastering and so Traditionally, the mastering engineer would take the mixed audio and make it uh, as loud as possible without the vinyl lathe cutting through the vinyl all the way because, you know, the, the amplitude of how deep the grooves are is going to be how loud it is. And so traditionally, that's how the mastering engineer would, uh, that, that's the job that they would do. And so now with digital audio, mastering is a little bit different and you're trying to hit those loudness levels depending on where the audio is going to be distributed. So whether that's YouTube or Spotify, and that does come up quite often. Normally uh, a recording engineer would just, and it depends on the size of, and the scope of the project, obviously, but the recording engineer would typically capture the audio and maybe even send uh, a, a mixed sort of version of that off to the, to the client. But then that's typically not mastered per se especially because the recording engineer often doesn't know the goals and, and where that audio is going to be distributed. And so the, the, the mastering engineer really needs to know those fine details. You know, if you're sending to Netflix or if you're sending to Spotify, you know, they have different loudness and different uh, audio expectations. And so the, the mastering engineer really needs to hone in on what those goals are. So if that comes up last minute, sometimes it's difficult to make those uh, adjustments um, in a timely fashion. And so that does come up sometimes, but it's not too complicated of a process as long as it's, you know, laid out properly and you know where the audio is going to be distributed to. Um, most recently, the term producer sort of just encompasses everything now. So, yeah. Next, uh, next recording, I'm going to have you as the engineer, but I'm going to hire Quincy Jones as my producer. <laughs> um, <laughs> Nick, uh, the next thing I wanted to ask about was what recording skills do you think a performer should develop for their own basic needs and to understand the recording process? Do you recommend per performers purchasing like really specialized recording gear, like actual nice microphones or just using like an iPhone or Zoom H2 and so on? Right, right. And so I sort of touched on this a minute ago, but the gear that you, uh, the gear pathway that you go down is really gonna depend on your goals as a performer and as a, as a hobbyist recordist. And so um, if you're wanting to make personal recordings where the quality and the accuracy reproduction uh, is necessary and that audio really does need to represent what the audio would sound like if you were there in person uh, would be. If you're wanting to do that, the gear is gonna differ slightly from if you're just trying to make recordings so that you can analyze your playing, which I think every percussionist and every musician should do. So at the minimal level, you're having gear that allows you to analyze your playing and get better as a performer. And then maybe you can take it a little bit further if you're wanting to do songwriting or uh, record uh, music and, and audio that can be later distributed on platforms. And so some of the technical skills that go along with both of those pathways would first definitely be microphone placement. And I touched on that a minute ago as well, that that's uh, extremely important when you're trying to make a recording for either purpose. And so that obviously involves where the microphone is in the room, the proximity to the instrument or the instruments um, to get the most accurate sound or the sound that is desired. And so that could also include a close mic versus a far mic, or maybe you're using both. How much do you mix in of each? You know, what placement per type of microphone? You should probably know the difference between a cardioid, an omnidirectional, and a bidirectional microphone. And there's also other pickup patterns, but those are the three most common. And so if you're recording snare drum in a hall, maybe you want omnidirectional if it's a nice hall and you want to hear some of that re uh, reverb from the hall. Or if you're close miking a tom on a drum set, you probably want cardioid and you probably want it to be pretty close. So there's uh, different nuances that are going to affect the acoustic qualities of your recording, whether you're just doing it for analyzation or for production purposes. And so the second thing that I would probably consider is hardware connectivity. You know, if you're not understanding how to connect all these things together, how they talk to each other, then it's going to be really difficult to make a recording. And so that can be easy or difficult sometimes, depending on the platform that you're on, whether it's Mac OS or Windows or what hardware you're using with each. Sometimes things don't talk to each other on certain platforms. Some devices are Thunderbolt, some are USB. 
And so we're getting into a little bit technical terms now, but um, understanding how everything talks to each other and how the audio gets from your instrument and through the air, how does it get captured and how does it ultimately get into your computer and into your headphones? Uh, and that sort of brings us to the next point is signal flow. For anyone who's wanting to seriously pursue audio or live sound, or even just wants to understand how to make these recordings for themselves, signal flow is probably the most important aspect that you should master first, because you have to understand, like I said, how the audio gets captured, how does it get to the computer, how do those, how do changes along that pathway make the final product sound different. And so that's really important to, to understand at a, at a very high level to make proper recordings. And going along with that gain staging at each point uh, of the signal chain is gonna be important as well to get the best quality of sound into your recording. And so that an example <clears throat> of the signal flow for, for a standard recording would be the microphone or, or first the instrument, obviously, which produces the sound and comes through the air, then gets picked up by the microphone's diaphragm, goes through the cable, goes to an analog to digital converter, which is gonna convert the audio into a digital format, which we use now. Uh, then that's probably gonna go to an audio interface, which is responsible for taking that digital audio and getting it into your computer or your uh, DAW, your digital audio workstation, where you're probably gonna be editing the audio. Then you'll probably have a digital to analog converter, which is gonna send the audio to your headphones and to your speakers. And so understanding how each of those devices work and how they connect which devices go in which order, that's extremely important to understand to make any level of recording regardless of the purpose. And so last sort of point that I would touch on would be listening skills. Obviously as musicians, we try to hone our listening skills in all areas, but definitely understanding when you make a change, maybe you turn a knob on the gain of the microphone, how does that affect what's happening? And then also in software, you know, if you're using plugins or if you're, if you're trying to to capture certain things, you know, how do changes in the software affect the final product? What changes do I notice? You know, what changes need to be made? What are subjective qualities that maybe some people would make and what would I make? What am I going for? You know, so there's definitely a lot of really nuanced aspects that I think everyone should understand whether they're trying to just make home recordings or whether they're producing a CD. What the heck do those little DI boxes do? Oh my gosh, a DI box. So that is very, that's very important. So And will if, it get rid of the hum I hear in my recording? It it might. It yes. might. Okay. So if it has a ground lift, it might. Or it might not, depending on. I mean, it, they're all different. So we need but, yes and we need yes and no from here on. Right. <laughs> so the purpose of a DI box is gonna be to uh, convert an instrument level signal to a, a a a either some some are line level and some are microphone level, but it's, it's really sorry about to, converting the level of... Sorry to interrupt, but what does DI stand for something? Direct input, then. Okay, that's what I Direct guess. Direct input, yes. <laughs> sure. And so the, the main uh, application for that would be maybe you have a, a bass guitar. Obviously, you can't plug the bass. Well, actually, some audio interfaces now have DI inputs, but um, the most traditional way to connect that would be to plug the bass guitar into the DI box, and then you get an XLR out, which is then going to go into your microphone preamp. And so... They, off, they also often even have a loop out so then you can go to like a bass amp. And so those are super important in live sound. Not as much in recording because like I said, most audio interfaces now have the DI inputs, which are pretty good most of the time. And so you do see that a lot in live sound though, especially for bands and cool. But yeah. <laughs> so it's, I mean, it's fascinating to hear you talk about this because you, you so clearly know exactly what you're talking about with all of this. And uh, it brings me back to my rant. I've gone on a couple of times on the podcast, but it's it's so offensive to me that university music programs will so readily, easily buy a $15,000 marimba for students to just go to town on. But the second that students need access to $1,000 worth of audio gear, it's, it's usually like this whole like, oh, we don't have that. It has to stay behind locked doors. We don't want it walking off. We don't want to damage. Like it's so essential for performers to have access to microphones, interfaces, audio software, all to like, understand how this process works and right. uh, you you answered that question very well just to, to reiterate if anyone forgot the question was sort of like what recording skills techniques should performers be doing to understand the process so that when they meet up with an engineer they they understand what's going on uh but i actually for a second uh i had a thought when you were talking i wanted to flip that question on its head because 
it's interesting if you think about it, there are no recording engineers that do not perform themselves at some level, right? There's, there's not many people, I can't think of anyone that records music that has never actually played music. <laughs> right. And right. so uh, I guess like, to flip the question on its head, uh, as a recording engineer, like what is, what is important for an engineer to like study in terms of, of understanding music? Right. But I guess also, obviously that would probably depend partially on if you're recording choirs or rock bands or percussion ensemble. Uh huh. So I think I have a pretty good lens to answer this question through. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I am fully employed uh, full time at uh, Christ United Methodist Church in Plano, Texas, where I'm the AV coordinator. And so I do lots of recordings for different ensembles there, as well as obviously through my freelance business, I do lots of different types of recordings. And so having the versatility as a musician to understand the nuances that that ensemble is trying to bring to the table is really important in understanding how to capture those. And so if you're recording a choir, you really want to, you know, so if you close mic a choir, you're not going to get that sort of blended choir sound. And when I was beginning uh, a recording engineer, I was really running into this problem a lot is I thought that maybe if there's like a soprano, alto, tenor, bass section, that each of those sections should have their own microphone. And I learned very quickly that that was not the best way <laughs> to make to make a recording of a choir because when you're sitting in, in my case, at, uh, at the church, uh, if you're sitting in the pews when the choir is singing, you're hearing a blended sound of that room after the sound has already all bounced around and combined together. So you're hearing almost every section together versus if you were to close mic all of them, you would hear sort of individually in the stereo image. And so it's really important to understand how to uh, mic those types of groups to get the uh, to get an accurate reproduction of what it would sound like if you were there um, in that performance. And so that goes for percussion ensemble as well, uh, solo chamber groups, um, especially. So I think definitely the skills of understanding how sound blends together per ensemble and, uh, and also just per instrument and understanding how to capture that and then mix um, to reproduce that effect. Uh, within a recording. And that goes with some of the terminology that you mentioned earlier, sound stage, stereo image, you know, understanding how to place things in the stereo image to where you're getting a, you know, almost like a fake reproduction of that, because obviously you just have headphones or you have speakers. So it's not going to sound like you're in a cathedral if you're listening to your speakers in a bedroom. And so as an engineer, you have to understand how to almost fake how to get those aspects in a recording through microphone placement and types and everything that I mentioned before. One, one thing actually that I didn't uh, touch on for that question uh, before that I wanted to mention was actually the gear that you should be looking at if you're trying to make recordings for yourself um, through one of those two pathways. And so um, I think in your question, you mentioned having an iPhone or having a Zoom recorder, you know, those are gonna be the lower level of entry level um, recording for analyzation purposes. And so if all you have is access to your phone's voice memos app, and you're trying to understand how can I make my snare drum playing better? And how can I, you know, improve my playing on any instrument without spending 10 grand on uh, ways to record myself, you know, an iPhone can do that. And so the, the second level, um, obviously upgrading in sound quality and uh, expandability in the future would be the zoom recorders, which I really like. Um, Taskcam also makes some similar form factor to the Zoom recorders, but those are going to be sort of the second, maybe a uh, second step of entry level sound quality. You know, some of them have built in stereo array microphones, some have XLR inputs that are going to allow you to expand in the future. The third level would probably be, I could recommend like the Audio Technica 40 series. And so you're starting to get into single or, or matched pair large diaphragm, diaphragm microphones and in Rob Knopper's uh, 12 Days of Daily Clues, that's actually what he recommends recording yourself with is a, a single large diaphragm microphone, either in cardioid or omnidirectional so that you can get um, a more accurate representation of, of what your, your sound is actually coming across like. And then the last sort of level of gear, and this is really dumbing it down, there's tons of stuff in between these levels. These are pretty large variances in price, but the highest end is gonna be your Sheps, Earthworks, DPA, which are gonna have a much flatter frequency response. They're gonna color the sound less. And so if you need that complete, transparent, accurate reproduction of the audio, you're gonna to want to go with that professional level 
um, which is what most professional engineers are going to be using. Um, and that's going to come with a price as well. <laughs> do you know, do you know why it's so hard for microphones to just be flat? Like, why do they all the you know, frequency range responses are like all over the place? Like, why is it so, why is it such a big ticket money item? What's so hard about creating like flat response? So it really comes down to the electronic components used inside. And so the, the different combinations of the electronic components, you know, the circuit design, as well as the quality uh, of the individual components is really going to affect uh, how flat the microphone is. And so the highest quality components are going to be obviously more expensive. And so that's why those are usually reserved for the higher end, uh, much, much more expensive microphones, because they're using those higher components, as well as they're going to be more accurate between each other. Like if, if you don't want to have two of the same model microphones sound different. Um, if you bought maybe one a year ago and you want another one, you want them to sound exactly the same. And so that accuracy and precision and reproduction is extremely important. And that comes at a high price for sure. Uh, uh, I have uh, AKG, the long silver ones. Oh, yeah. Is that the technical name, Casey? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, the, long, number, yeah. The, long the long silver ones. ones, but they're really like notorious mics. Like you notice, Nick knew what I was talking about. I, I can't for the life of me think that number off the top of my head. I could look it up, but um, I don't remember off the top of my head either. But but they have a very high and like even frequency uh, uh, at the top. Like like it's pretty flat, and then it's very like round at the top. Um, and I just love them. Like I think they and they do everything well. Aside from the like the crispiest, um, you know, because they do have the huge high bump, they're really really crispy. I know they're used a lot on like hi hats mm -hmm. uh, be, because they're just really really ticky and articulate. But I love them for everything. Like we do marimba. We do. I just I, I don't know. So it's interesting. Like well, I know flat is like a hard thing to get, but they have this huge bump in the top, and I, I still right, just right. love them. And another aspect for if you're just you know, considering microphone specs uh, as a percussionist, you want to find, and actually that's funny, this is a spec uh, that's not often actually published on uh, manuals and spec sheets, but the transient response time of a microphone is so important for percussion. Um, a really good example of one that uh, can do wonders is uh, all of the Earthworks um, uh, room yeah. microphones. Yep. And so if you're recording, uh, basically all of our instruments with fast transient response times, you know, that microphone is going to be able to capture that audio sooner versus a microphone with a slower one. It's not going to have that punch and that, you know, crispiness, like you said, of some of our instruments, especially hi-hat and snare drum. And that's why you see Earthworks used a lot on drums and, and percussion. Gotcha. C451B, I looked it up real quick. Just right, right. That's it. Yeah. Well, Nick, you uh, obviously have a lot of experience with this, and, and you mentioned to me that you started recording when you were in high school. Uh, and so what got you interested in recording in the first place? What were some of your early projects like? And what did you try to do in college to further your audio skill set? That is a great question. My entire background in music production and recording is sort of all over the place, actually. And so in high school, recording itself actually wasn't really on my radar. You know, I was really interested actually in music production uh, in regards to beat making and like sort of uh, FL studio, you know, music uh, songwriting and other music production uh, terms. And so I, I learned FL studio first, which is really not for recording. <laughs> and then I moved to Ableton Live later, which is also some higher up recording engineers would really not say is used often for recording, but it is what I know the best. So I like Ableton. Um, but a lot of my influences at that time were really like EDM artists like Skrillex and Dead Mouse and, and people like that. And so I really wanted to make music like they did. So I was really into virtual instruments and uh, like synthesizers. And some of them are still huge influences to me today. So like Dead Mouse, especially his stage design and event production uh, using a lot of like programming languages is really interesting to me. And also Zomboy's stage lighting uh, for his event production is done by Christian Jackson, who is a huge inspiration to me in terms of just um, overall AV sort of lighting production and, and visual stuff. And so at that point, I was really more into the, the music production side. Uh, but as I moved from high school to college, I sort of took those Ableton, you know, DAW skills that I learned in terms of songwriting and applied them to uh, live performance, especially in percussion. 
And so, as well as lighting accompaniment, electronic accompaniment, um, and things like that. And so earlier I mentioned Evan Chapman, Evan Chapman and Fortin Media and Square Peg Round Hole, their whole AV sort of performance as aesthetic is a, is a huge inspiration to me. And so once I got into college, I sort of, sort of, uh, started learning about those groups um, who really inspired me. Also, Russell Wharton, who was actually my private lesson teacher in high school. Um, his pieces like Phylogenesis, Dosex Metronome, Evan Chapman's Glimmer, uh, Alexis Lamb's Post Lightened, uh, Nigel Westlake also um, are huge uh, inspirations to me in terms of just live performance. And so that was where my digital audio skill set sort of lived uh, the first couple of years of my life at university. And so uh, once I started getting more into recording specifically, obviously I had those DAW skills and I understood signal flow. I understood how to navigate digital audio. Um, I understood at a basic level, you know, what gear was needed. And so the way that I sort of augmented those fundamentals was through a, a course by Dr. Neil Anderson Himmelsbach at TCU. Shout out. He is a, also a huge inspiration to me, but um, I only took one course with him because TCU actually doesn't offer a huge uh, variety of music technology and recording and, and, and courses like that. But we do have advanced electroacoustics who Dr. Himmelsbach teaches. And so I was able to augment a lot of my DAW skills through his course where we focused a lot on songwriting and music production in Ableton and uh, other DAWs as well. He also had a laptop ensemble is what it was called. I think it had a, a more professional name than that, but I can't think of it off the top of my head right now. Everyone just called it the laptop ensemble, but that was sort of like a performing ensemble using only music technology. So software and hardware instruments, synthesizers, you know, MIDI keyboards, stuff like that. And so an example of one piece that we were uh, performed in that ensemble was we did Terry Riley's NC, but we only used software instruments and synthesizers. So that sort of, uh, electroacoustic performance music production scene was sort of what I took all the way through college. And then it wasn't until the end of my, uh, of my college career that I sort of really got into recording itself. And so I know, Ben, you mentioned um, you heard a couple things on my SoundCloud where I was able to record TCU. And so the first sort of bone that I got through um, from Brian West, the uh, professor of percussion at TCU was I was able to record our basic tour and so that was actually through the lens of recording to play back and analyze so that we could obviously make changes um, for our basic performance. And so that was a good opportunity to make a recording through that lens, but obviously I still wanted it to be distributable afterwards. So it was sort of like splitting both of those lenses. Um, but that was sort of the first big recording project that I was able to do. And I just took that experience from um, recording those pieces on that tour. Um, and really kind of ran with uh, that opportunity. And so throughout that whole time, obviously I was self-specializing um, through these auxiliary opportunities in college, even though they seem surface level, not related, you know, some of them are songwriting, some of them are recording, um, but they all really inspired me to follow a career in AV and in, uh, in music uh, production in general. And so, uh, and, and keep in mind, my degree was actually music education. So this self-specialization was happening all the way through while I was still doing, you know, marching band and college, you know, music education courses. So I was really able to self-specialize through this, some of this stuff on my own. Another huge influence um, that helped me take some of that uh, fundamental knowledge and um, almost jumpstart it was through uh, my attendance to the NAM show. And so I've always been a huge um, uh, fan of the NAM organization and a shout out to Joe Lamond, who is the CEO of NAM, actually, who I first met by giving him a tour of the TCU School of Music. Uh, at the time, I didn't know he was the CEO of NAM, but uh, I was able to meet him through that. And as he was leaving, he had a NAM shirt on and I was like, oh, that's a cool shirt. And he was like, thanks, I'm the CEO. And I was like, oh my gosh. And then <laughs> nice. as he got in the car and left. And then so I, I sent him an email later and was like, it was great to meet you again, you know, asked him questions about NAM. And <clears throat> a little bit later, I think it was the next year, um, I actually applied and received the NAM President's Innovation Award, which was a, a fully funded attendance to the NAM show. And so that was a huge kind of perspective 
eye opener seeing the music industry as a whole. You know, sometimes I think as university percussionists, we're a little bit not sort of isolated, but we don't have the perspective of the music industry as a whole. And so having that opportunity to attend and see that gigantic, you know, the NAM show is the biggest uh, music industry convention. Uh, I don't know about in the world, but I think it definitely in the United States. But uh, so, so seeing that on such a large scale really opened my eyes to, okay, I can take all of these fundamentals that I know through all these auxiliary experiences and form something that uh, I, can I can really follow um, based on what I'm interested in. And so I really started pushing to learn more about recording specifically, as well as music technology, um, AV in general, you know, information technology. A lot of uh, digital audio now is all networked audio. And so IT skills are really important, understanding IP addresses, you know, 10 years ago, we didn't have, I mean, we probably had it, but it really wasn't, uh, you know, deployed at the level it is now, but a lot of digital audio is really understanding uh, IT fundamentals. So just taking all of those uh, basic fundamentals of AV in general and really forming something uh, which eventually turned into Sardello Sound and Immersio Entertainment, forming those entities that I could really run with, with the skills that I had. So that's sort of how I, how I took my original uh, EDM inspiration from high school and took it and ran with it all the way through college. So it, it seems that many colleges are now offering uh, some sort of commercial music, music technology degree, something along those lines. Uh, but most of those programs are in their infancy. Uh, the university where I teach, we have one that's now, I think, entering its sixth year. Uh, and so what do you think these students should try and take advantage of now? And what do you feel needs to be added to these programs? Right, right. And so I mentioned with my personal experience, TCU not having a huge amount of, you know, music production, uh, traditional offerings, you know, I think that's the case with a lot of, uh, of universities and, and traditional programs. Uh, one of my, one of my favorite YouTube channels, Spectre Sound Studios, who's run by Glenn Fricker. He has a really great no way. outlook I on this. I love that guy. Yeah, right, right. He's hilarious. He, he has an amazing outlook. Um, I know his channel is a little bit, you know, rock and metal focused, but his outlook and, and, and uh, experience with traditional recording schools, it, 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 I think represents uh, as a whole sort of where we are, which I don't think as recording focused only, I don't think we're there yet. In terms of the price for what the amount of information and the amount of true experience that they offer, a lot of places really aren't there yet, I think. Now, in terms of you know more broad programs that are focused on media arts, music technology, AV, IT, even video production, live events, um, that sort of thing, there are some programs that are doing very great things. And some of those um, that have been on my radar are uh, MTSU, their Department of Recording Technology has a lot of true recording experience where as at a lot of uh, other schools, you're not getting you know, that really, that field work experience. So you may learn lots of technical aspects and you may uh, learn a lot about the fundamentals of recording, but you're not getting that true experience. And so MTSU, I know, has, uh, has a pretty good uh, department for that, as well as University of Michigan has been on my radar as well. Their Department of Performing Arts Technology is actually outside of the School of Music. I believe, uh, don't quote me on that, I believe it's in their theater, dance, and um, that sort of department. I don't remember the exact name, but they're teaching, you know, not just recording, but live events. You know, how do you do live sound? How do you do lighting? How do you do general AV, even architectural AV? And so I think uh, as a whole, university programs should really be going that direction as a more broad focus. And then if you enjoy recording and you want to be a recording engineer, you can then specialize in that field versus going to recording school I think is really going to set a lot of people up for not a lot of opportunities afterwards, especially because a lot of those programs that do exist are really focused on working in studios. And everyone knows that recording studios traditionally are sort of a downhill uh, industry at this point because of all the home recording. And so I think university programs really need to be thinking bigger picture, um, especially even uh, introducing like video production, like I said, and, and other AV terms as, as opposed to just recording. Another program that um, I, I, I've heard is very great is Berkeley College of Music, their music technology study abroad in Spain. I think they have one in Boston as well, but the Spain 
one uh, is definitely sort of focused on that broad AV, which I think is very important. Um, and then other just broad programs uh, that would have pathways to those opportunities, maybe near a large company. Like if you wanted to work for Ableton, maybe you could study abroad in Berlin where their, uh, their headquarters are. And so, you know, really just thinking about the type of work that you want to do and weighing in on, you know, does this program offer the sufficient experience for me to pursue this after I graduate? You know, I think um, a lot of universities are close in that regard, but I think they really need to start broadening, especially because the traditional recording school working in a studio sort of pathway is, is, is a dying industry. Unfortunately, pretty sad that that is the case, but it does have a little bit of a silver lining, like I said, because of all the amazing home recording, you know, type of stuff like Billie Eilish, her music was all recorded at home. So there's, there's definitely a lot of, um, there's a lot of innovation happening, but I think the the programs really just need to catch up with that. You know, I think students interested in those programs should really consider, you know, other avenues that may be related to the thing they're most interested in. And so an example of that would be if you're interested in recording, maybe you should also focus a little bit on uh, live sound, producing a band, you know, how do I work in a venue? And that can even go on to stage uh, lighting design. And so I think trying to be as versatile as possible as a student is extremely important. And then because that's going to give you the skills once you graduate to assess the job market in your area and go, okay, there's only lighting design technicians being hired right now. You know, how do I learn that skill as a recording engineer or, or, or a live sound engineer and, uh, you know, fill in some of those holes in my own skills so that I can get the work that's in my area. And so I think that's another big uh, thing to consider when looking at a university program is where are they located in terms of the type of work that I think I want to do? Because if you're, if you're a new student, you probably don't know exactly what you want to do yet. But if you're like a freshman going to a recording school, maybe, you know, somewhere like Tennessee would be good because you're close to Nashville, you're close to places that are known for being amazing recording, you know, music production places, as opposed to going to a university that is not in that area. So I think it's really important to just consider broadly, um, you know, what your goals are and what that program could offer. Nick, uh, we have one more question today, and that's that most creative career paths require some sort of large uh, business skill set or other skill set that's not taught in school, like creating a website, budgeting, et cetera. So can you tell us about your experience with quote unquote, the hustle? Yeah, sure, sure. And so this is this is definitely a, a very overlooked part of the work that I do um, in programs, especially. And so going back to the last question really, really fast, I think it's really important for students to also gain some of these skills that I'm about to mention. And so you know, for me personally, AV and music technology and recording are my passions, but at the end of the day, you know, they're also, they have to be my profession. And so there has to be a lens for that as well. And so, um, you know, currently I'm a member of the Recording Academy. I know you mentioned at the beginning uh, that I was a Grammy U um, uh, apprentice, which was a huge sort of jump start to my knowledge um, and acquisition of skills uh, towards the business side of the music industry. Um, I was lucky enough to study under uh, the Grammy voting member, uh, Smooth uh, LeJohn Smooth D. Manoy, who, who is uh, pretty awesome. He, if you don't know how the Recording Academy works, um, they're the association uh, responsible for the Grammy Awards. And so there are members of the Recording Academy um, that uh, get to vote for the Grammys and that's how, how the awards are given out. And so I'm not a voting member yet myself, but I was able to study under, under LeJohn, who is a voting member, um, mostly about music business fundamentals, contract literacy, um, and so, some of the other uh, important you know, hustle skills, how to deal with clients, how to make an invoice, you know, how, to, how to manage your assets. And so I was really lucky to, to have that opportunity to sort of, because leaving TCU, by the way, this was happening during my student teaching um, for my music ed degree. So I was studying under LeJohn as well. And that was also sort of right at the beginning of, uh, of COVID-19. And so a lot of this happened virtually, but I was really lucky to have the opportunity to, to study under him to jumpstart my, my business skills. <laughs> and so uh, Joe Lamond, I mentioned earlier, the NAM CEO, 
um, in the President's Innovation Award Program, um, as well as the educational seminars at the NAM show, were also a huge proponent of my uh, acquisition of business skills. You know, a lot of the, the, the booths and the panels at NAM are focused on business uh, readiness and how to manage, you know, if you're self-employed or how to manage a music business because the NAM show is so focused on press and, and those sort of aspects, those traditional music industry um, aspects. And so attending there and, and sitting in on a lot of those panels really gave me, uh, I think the perspective that I needed to approach the business side of the music industry, you know, some amazing resources that I often go to um, if I, if I need, you know, advice on, on self-employment um, stuff, obviously not personal advice, but general resources, you know, the Dave Ramsey show and Ramsey solutions, they have great, you know, just general self-employment, small business money management um, resources. Uh, also, Brian Preston from the Money Guy Show has great resources on on self employment, and is specifically in the context of like retirement planning, all these things as a musician that you really don't often uh, consider. And so, having a small business that just gets amplified even more. And so, you have to really understand, you know, how do I do my taxes? How do I do all the things that nobody ever wants to talk about? Um, and so, those resources, as well as um, I'm a member of the Music Business Association, who uh, has a lot of resources as well on understanding contracts. They have contract templates that you can use, invoice templates, you know, a lot of educational resources on, on how to navigate clients. How do you navigate relationships with clients? How do you bill somebody? What happens if they don't pay you? How do you, you know, just navigate those, those waters as well? You know, you said something that I thought was so succinct, but so perfect. You said that it's your passion as well as your profession. And I think oftentimes we can get caught up in the passion side of things. And so, hey, Casey, can you come be a guest artist for me for, for 25 bucks next month? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, these, oh. these things, you you have to you know watch out for the business end of them and, and not let your sort of heart take over. Uh, and Cameron Leach, a few weeks ago on Facebook, posted this great thing I just wanted to share. Uh, Cameron said, the goal of paying someone for their art whether commissioning new music, paying performers, or anything else should always be how much money can I possibly get you for your creative energy, talents, and effort, as opposed to the current trend of what's the lowest amount we can pay you and get what we mm -hmm. want. Stop underpaying and undervaluing artists. There's so much more to it than what you see on show day and so much more behind the notes on a sheet of paper, uh, which I think is 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 excellent. Uh, and right. I think we've all, there's of course like a, a delicate, balancing act especially when we're young of trying to do things that will forward your career and also watching out for your own uh bottom line and i think that's so important to highlight the the business skill set of it right one of the biggest struggles that i had starting out um as a freelancer was just you know how do i um take the opportunities that come to me um, while still valuing the work that i can provide you know so i did a lot of free work in college and, and, and before, as well as even after college, you know, depending on the opportunity, it's sometimes too good to pass up that experience, um, even if you feel like that work should be compensated for. And so as a beginning engineer and a beginning AV um, technician, it's really important to uh, really just value your own work. Uh, and sometimes you do need to work for free um, and sometimes, you know, once you get some of that experience, uh, you can start navigating the waters of, okay, I have experience in this area. I think my work is valued at this much, and this is what I think I should be paid. And sometimes that's a hard conversation to have with new clients and even old clients as well, you know, depending on the area. So it's definitely a hard, a, a hard aspect of, of being a freelancer for sure. It's a, um, if I could just add one little thing, I think there's like a discussion about how it is versus how it should be. You know, it's like, I got in a long Facebook argument over that. I, was, I wasn't going to bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> right. But like over just like pay and the discussion is like, Hey, is this how it should be? Or is this how it is? And there was confusion over like, <laughs> was I advocating for this is good pay or not? It's like, I'm not saying this is like how it should be. I'm just saying this is how it is. And for how it currently is, this is decent pay. 
Uh, but yeah, that's always like a like an interesting thing. It's like, well, should you go do something for free or not? It's like, well, I don't know. I mean, how much would you pay for a foot in the door? You know, right. like working for free, it's like you're losing money. But if you, and that's the thing. It's like, well, will this lead to a foot in the door? You can never really know. You know, it's just it's kind of a calculated risk that that yeah, we all have to all have to do. It seems. And that's For the sure, story yeah. I keep hearing. It's like, hey, people are successful, seem to have done this. You know, they seem to continually have done this at some point, you know. I, yeah. I was going to say it's like in, in the U.S., it's kind of taboo to talk about money. We, we don't really like to talk about money. And actually, if I if I can just share, I won't, I won't share exact numbers or anything. But uh, Matt and I, when we had Nick record, uh, we, we had someone with just a buddy that was going to record us and he couldn't do it. So Matt kind of did some research and found Nick and he's like, hey, how does this guy look? And Matt was like, yeah, I think we could probably offer him like 100, 200 bucks, something like that. And he'll come out and do it. And then I actually asked our, our group chat on the podcast, like, hey, how much is a, how much should a recording cost? And, and Ksenia chimed in with, with her number. And I was like, yeah, that's that's kind of more what I was thinking than like 100 to 200 bucks. And then Nick was very uh, professional and kind of said, hey, I, I think I might actually be out of your price range. This This is kind of how much I cost, which is sort of what Ksenia said. And we didn't try to haggle. We didn't try and like, well, we, we would really appreciate if you, you know, it was like, okay, sounds good. We'll do it. So, right, right. <laughs> yeah. So it, you have to, you definitely have to stand up for yourself and, and what you know you're worth. Right. Unfortunately, as a new engineer though, you know, sometimes you don't always have that, that luxury, especially if you don't have a lot of experience. And so it's definitely really hard to navigate those waters. And if, if you feel like your work is worth that amount, then, you know, sometimes depending on the opportunity, you may have to be a stickler on it versus, you know, working for free, especially as a new engineer. You know, I'm lucky enough to now be at the, at the sort of time of my, of my freelance career that I feel comfortable, you know, making those calls, um, depending on the time commitment and obviously the, the numbers and everything like that, but it definitely wasn't always, uh, like that. And so, like I said, I've definitely done free work, uh, especially starting out. And so personally, I don't think I would pass up an opportunity as a new, even especially if you're a student, you know, even if people around you are getting paid to do the same work, if you're a student and you're trying to learn from these experiences, you know, just do, do the work, especially if you have the gear, you know, if it's not a big overhead of having to buy stuff, if you already have the gear and can do it and you already have the, the basic knowledge, you know, just do it. And that could lead to, to more opportunity opportunities in the future to get paid, or you never know where it'll take you. So for, for students and new engineers, I would definitely say just just do as much work you, as you can and, and don't worry too much about the hustle part. <laughs> this this might have been a, a Carlyism. I can't remember who said this, but uh, or no, I think it was one of our guests. Remind me if it sounds familiar. Uh, but uh, someone said there's there's three things. There's m the money, there's like the music, and there's like the hang, like the people that you're working with. Right. And when you're starting out, like you want at least two of those things covered. Like you know, maybe this isn't the greatest music in the world, but the people are really good and it pays really well. So that's why you'll do it. I think that it's, of course, like we all have a price and like as younger, you know, student recorders are, are, are moving on to being professionals, you have to start weighing out those things. Like what, what am I getting out of this? Is this actually going to lead to more connections or is someone just trying to take advantage and get me for the, the lowest number possible? Right. And if you can get two of those things, even if the pay is not in there, I mean, it's worth it. Well, thank you so much, Nick, for your generous time here. And we look forward to seeing everyone on episode 295.